Explanations for important events that involve secret plots by powerful and malevolent groups. Gertzel, 1994. This is the academic definition of conspiracy theories in a fledgling new field that has been emerging in the last 15 years called the psychology of conspiracy theories. It's a field that seems particularly relevant now when conspiracy theories at least appear to be becoming a widespread phenomenon. In this episode we're going to look at the case for conspiracy theories being an adaptive mechanism for a human population. We'll be looking at why the conspiracy mindset is not an aberration but a normal human faculty that becomes absurd at its extremes but on the whole is a necessary component of a healthy human society. Harry Markopoulos is the man that exposed Bernie Madoff and the biggest Ponzi scheme in history. Despite being investigated by the SEC, Madoff was never found out. He managed to continue his scheme from the 1980s right up until 2009. There were numerous occasions where investigators or people in the industry had raised question marks over what Madoff was doing, but nothing ever came of them. Why? Is it because of a conspiracy? Was the SEC in cahoots with Madoff and helping out a man of their own class? In his book Talking to Strangers, Malcolm Gladwell explores this larger than life story. A central theme of the book is the insight of psychologist Tim Levine, who has developed a theory around the human ability to tell truths from lies. This theory is called the truth default theory, and the basic idea is that when we're in doubt, we assume that people are telling the truth. This assumption tends to be right most of the time and is an adaptive belief for function of a harmonious society. But on a large enough scale, you'll always get someone like Madoff, who games the system and lies through their teeth. The reason why Madoff wasn't found out all those years is that people defaulted to truth. There were doubts around Madoff but in general he was convincing enough and the allegation of his running the biggest Ponzi scheme in history was so outrageous that everyone just defaulted to truth. Everyone that is, except Harry Markopoulos. Harry was different. Rather than defaulting to truth as the majority of us do, Markopoulos sees dishonesty and stupidity everywhere. People have too much faith in large organisations, he said. They trust the accounting firms which you should never trust because they're incompetent. On a best day, they're incompetent. On a bad day, they're crooked and aiding and abetting the fraud, looking the other way. He thought between 20 and 25% of public companies were cheating on their financial statements. When he was in university, a professor gave him an A, but Markopoulos double checked the formula the professor used to calculate grades and realised that there had been a mistake. He had actually been earned an A minus. He went to the professor and complained. When he got his first job after business school, he worked for a brokerage that sold over-the-counter stocks. One of the rules of that marketplace is that the broker must report any trade within 90 seconds. So when Markopoulos discovered that his new employer was taking longer than 90 seconds, what do you reckon he did? He reported his own bosses to the regulators. <laughs> I think you can see why Markopoulos was the man to sniff out the Madoff deception. The man saw patterns of corruption everywhere. He didn't default to truth, he defaulted to deception. In light of the Madoff case, he might seem like the warrior of wisdom and integrity that we need. He might seem like the man who can see the truth while the rest of us walk blind. You might even think that we should want such men to be common, but I would suggest that we think again. When Markopoulos had failed to convince the SEC of Madoff's guilt, he began to suspect that Madoff would want to off him, and he began carrying a pistol believing that his life was in danger. He installed a high-tech alarm system in his house, he replaced the locks, he made sure to take a different route home every night and this went on for years. And then, when Madoff finally turned himself in, Markopoulos still didn't think he was safe. Now he thought that the SEC would be after all his files because he had documented their incompetence and their failures and would make them look bad. He loaded up a shotgun and dug out his gas mask, in case they used tear gas, and barricaded himself in the house. There's a reason why default truth is the go-to program in the human psyche. It's because society could not survive with a certain quantity of Harry Markopoli. Nuclear war would long since have wiped us out, assuming of course a society so primed for distrust could ever cooperate enough to manage something like the Manhattan Project, which it absolutely could not. That's not to say we don't want any Harry Markopoli. No, I think that the distribution is pretty good as it is. We need some people in the tribe to be suspicious enough that they snuff out the few people who are corrupt. There's a balance at either end of the fringes that is necessary. If you looked at Harry Markopoulos when he was barricaded in his home, preparing for a siege from the SEC, when in fact they wanted to make him their new chief, you would think that this man was poorly adapted to his environment. But if you change the level of magnification, you can see that on the scale of society, having such individuals is actually adaptive. 
To my eyes, it's the same for conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists. On the level of the individual, conspiracy theory might seem maladaptive. You might see someone who is afraid of their own shadow and who picks up a pattern of malice in a sea of white noise. But conspiracy theorists are not always wrong. Sometimes they are correct and they are an important corrective to the system. Okay, so let's think about conspiracy as a continuum. We can take the academic definition of it as explanations that involve secret plots by powerful and malevolent groups. There's a lot of things that fit into that mould. As we talked about in the previous episode, when the Nazis heard the story of mass hysteria in reaction to Orson Welles' radio dramatisation of the War of the Worlds, their propaganda rag said, if Americans fall so easily for a fantastic radio broadcast of an invasion from Mars, that explains why they so readily believe Nazi atrocity tales. So when you think of the Nazis, that's one place where you'd say, okay, the conspiracy mindset is definitely required here. In that case, the government and the media colluded to cover up the Holocaust. So on one end, we might say, okay, well, that's a conspiracy that turned out to be 100% true. I'm sure there were people at the time who have dismissed such allegations as ridiculous. Nowadays, we'd be inclined to say that it's obvious that the Nazis would be doing Doing such a thing and we might say yeah well that's the Nazis we're different there's no truth to conspiracies in our modern Western world but then you have to think of things like the Tuskegee syphilis study in which the United States Public Health Service ran a 40-year experiment on unsuspecting African Americans with syphilis they could have cured the disease cheaply and easily with penicillin but instead they decided to make a study of syphilis at the expense of these people it's akin to the experiments of the Nazis and it's something that blurs the easy distinction between the Nazis being bad and a America being good. It's not that easy and it also explains why the black community in America has a higher rate of conspiracy beliefs around healthcare in the US. It's a case of once bitten twice shy and you can see there's a good reason for it and it's hard to trust a mainstream media and a government that tells you otherwise because these are the same cornerstones of the same system that stung you in the first place. This is one end of the conspiracy continuum. It's grounded in historical truth and it seems quite reasonable and yet it fits the definition of explanations for important events that involve secret plots by powerful and malevolent groups. Group. If someone in the 1960s had said the American government was running experiments on African American men to investigate syphilis, they would have been dismissed as conspiracy crackpots. When you look at the pool of conspiracy theories out there, what you're looking at are alternative narratives of the facts. The challenge is that most of the things in the box marked conspiracy theory are nonsense. So how do you decide which ones are true? The basic fact is that most of us are going to default to truth. That is going to be our go-to thing. And in reality, people like Markopolis are going to get on our nerves. They're gadflies irritating us, but they're adaptive. They will smell out foul play long before the rest of us. And that is, I believe, the role of the conspiracy theorist in polite society. They are white blood cells that have a valuable role in the workings of a healthy, functioning organism of human society. They sniff out the outliers on the other end of the scale, who are willing to game the system and can pull the wool over us herds that default to truth. The trouble, of course, is that because they default to deception, they will also smell out foul play that their imaginations have conjured up from the shadows. They come with a lot of false positives, at which point they begin to look less like healthy T-cells and more like an autoimmune disease or a cancerous growth. In normal conditions, this seems to work out. You get people who believe that the royal family are shape-shifting lizards, and you get people like Markopolis. The trouble is that with the internet, this seems to be mushrooming. There's more and more conspiracies and more and more outlandish conspiracies. There are people who believe that Finland doesn't exist and is a secret Russian and Japanese fishing ground. Then there are the flat earthers and the people who believe that Avril Lavigne died and was replaced by a body double. It seems to be becoming a cancerous growth where this fringe role is becoming much more common and that leads more people thinking like Markopolis living in fear of the shadows. And if that grows common enough, then you've got a recipe for instability of society. Now there's a chance that this growth doesn't actually have that much to do with the internet. There have been studies that shown that conspiracies are more common in times of crisis and so this growth in conspiracies could to some extent be explained by the tense times that we live in. But it's also possible that this is a corrosive development that destabilizes the social adhesive of the truth default theory. Either way, I don't think we can afford to dismiss conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists as a society. When you look at the historical examples, you can see that this attitude is adaptive. There are people who will use their position and power to achieve nefarious ends. These people exist. They are outliers, but they exist. And so we need a mechanism that deals with this. So we have our conspiracy theorists who are overly suspicious and pick up a lot of noise, but also have the chance to pick up an important signal that could be otherwise be missed. 
Conspiracy theories are adaptive and what we need is not to get rid of conspiracies but to develop a better approach to them, seeing them as a continuum with Finland deniers on one end and more plausible hypotheses and theories on the other end. We should be careful about the black and white thinking that dismisses anything that is labelled conspiracy. That label can be used as a tool. So as with so many things, the key is for us to develop our critical thinking. That's everything that I wanted to cover on this episode of The Living Philosophy. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please subscribe if you haven't already and if you have any thoughts, insights or feedback, love to hear from you down in the comments. Otherwise, I shall see you next time. Thank you for watching.